the second biennial Civi looks at a bunch of games in one video thing. So a couple months ago, there was that Realms Deep thing. You guys remember Realms Deep? Boomer Shooter Con 2020, where they announced 8,000 new retro FPS games. I never thought this kind of thing would happen. There were like three retro FPS revival games when I started this channel, and now there's a million of them, and I'm gonna have to make a video on every single one. Look at all of these. Limitless Hunger, Hellbound, Hell Ranger, Pain Sheriff, Hyper Gore, Disco Inferno, Hell Damned, Max Pain, Gunfire, Fire Gun, Super Jibs, Super Gibbs, Hell Killer, Gore Killer, Hyper Gore Killer, and of course, Ultra Kill. All of these are published by New Blood. Fuck it out, why not? you guys like Nightmare Reaper Episode 1, then you'll love Nightmare Reaper Episode 2. Not only is it more, it's twice as more. The update on Halloween added 9 new chapters, 8,000 billion new weapons, new monsters, and all the old monsters had their artwork redone so they don't look terrible. Performance improvements too. And instead of having to find a chainsaw to grapple around, for those of you who didn't see the first video, the chainsaw has a grappling hook on it, just go with it. The game gives you one at the very start of Episode 2, right before you get into the- <laughs> You weren't sorry for the sewer chapter last time, and you're not sorry now. Before you face a single enemy, Episode 2 introduces you to the new mechanics. The grappling hook that's bound to its own key and always works, and by always I mean unless you're getting shocked. Hashtag relatable, charges that can blow up walls, batteries that can power things up, and little grates that you can drop into, let's not call them sewer grates just to make things easier. The level design overall seems better, and even though they're still procedurally generated and snapped together by an uncaring machine, they flow better and the arenas are more interesting to play in, even if the themes of the level seem less varied than in episode 1. This is all urban settings, hospitals, docks, prisons, towers. Okay, there's one park. And Andrew Hulschult is still here because of course he is, and I have to give special mention to the weapon sounds in this game. Now, every playthrough of Nightmare Reaper tells a story, and this one, my third playthrough of Episode 2, where I started from the old save I used in the video I did on it way back when, was about getting progressively more ridiculous shotguns. I wouldn't normally go for a pump action, but this one has explosive ammo 1, and explosive ammo... I don't know, it isn't as useful as you might think, but sure, I'll keep it. And then one of the new random events is this doctor here who will let you change weapon stats or randomly upgrade rare weapons. It gives me explosive ammo too, but then I get another one that has plus one attack, which is like having a pump action double barrel, and that, outstanding. It has some weird pull mechanic, but that's fine. It kills some of the strongest enemies in two or three hits, until later when I pick up a quad barrel shotgun that's a level three weapon I can't keep. It has an ice effect in knockback four. Let me show you what knockback four does. And then I get the reflection power up. And then at the end of the level, I can't keep it because it's a level 3 weapon, and I understand why it would break the game. Leave an F in the comments for my quad shotgun. So I keep my pump action, and then the doc shows up again, and so I can re-roll a stat, which is... 
Oh, more pull? Yeah, fuck off. But then the doc shows up again and puts shock onto it, and that's where I am on this playthrough with an electric boomstick. And I'll still get murdered if I'm not careful around some of these new enemies that can freeze you or spawn skeletons or blow you up. And I'm still torn about keeping this gun at the end of the level because I picked up a knife that lets me fly. Love this game. What's next? This game is more chasm than chasm. You know, chasm, that game I've never actually played all the way through despite people telling me it's the greatest thing since whatever other games were fake 3D slob jank that need better source ports so I don't have to play them in DOSBox. I'm so tired of DOSBox, and I don't currently have access to a machine that'll run this stuff natively. I don't collect outdated technology like some better YouTube channels with that rock star lifestyle. Anyway, Harat. H-Rot. Why do I do this to myself? I've only ever barely spoken in one language with varying degrees of success, and so I started a YouTube channel where I have to pronounce things like Harat and Daki Makura. Existence is pain. The world would weep if it knew its own true face. Harat is made on some kind of completely original engine that looks exactly like a software rendered game from 1997. None of that we have to dirty up Unity to make it look worse like those hacks at New Blood. That itself is an achievement because it's dead on. It's even really, really brown. <laughs> The gameplay is fine. There's a couple issues, like I can't get this quake-like grenade to blow up this crack in the wall, but it's okay because I can pick up the weapon in that secret anyway and use it to blow up the crack in the wall. Secret found. Okay? Other than that, solid. Sets out to do a thing and then does that thing. The game shows some promise as a throwback shooter. I enjoyed it, even if the horse with the gas mask haunts my dreams. Oh god, why is it in the water? Please no. I have been trying to write an episode on Project Warlock for like a year, and I cannot for the life of me find enough to say about it to fill an entire video. I like it, it's a cool game. I got it at launch and have given it three playthroughs. It's fun, if a little bit easy. Project Warlock is a game by Buckshot Software, styled after retro FPS games. Less Doom, I guess, and more Wolfenstein because it has those crispy graphics and 90 degree walls, but that classic attitude of being a lone warrior going up against insurmountable odds over five episodes? The art style might turn some people off. I don't really mind it. It's pixelated, but you could tell a lot of care went into the animations. They're really smooth most of the time. It gave me weird Serious Sam on the Game Boy Advance vibes, except with, you know, better everything because it isn't an FPS game on the GBA trying to use the power of a Super Nintendo to make a game with hordes of monsters running at 12 FPS. Now the playthrough I have here is on medium. I would suggest playing on hard for a real challenge. The difference between the skills is that easy gives you infinite lives, medium and hard give you three lives at the start and you can pick up more, and hardcore is permadeath, which some people love. Losing all your progress after playing a game for hours, good for you, more power to you, I also enjoy being tortured. Hard mode makes enemies faster and deal double damage, and that does sound bad, but the game is a bit easy on medium for a while until like episode four, I would say. There's more depth to everything here than you'd expect. First, you have a leveling system that lets you improve your character's stats, ammo capacity, health, mana capacity, along with other perks and a spell system, which I don't use. If you want to know about the spell system, this is the wrong video for that. I find that the weapons are more than enough to carry me through because there's a million of them, and all of them have upgrades, like two per weapon, but you get to pick one. You find upgrade points for the weapons, and you get XP by killing, by finding treasure, and of course secrets, lots of them, and sometimes they're hidden well. Mostly you'll be looking for discolored textures or cracks in the wall. And also an interesting thing about how the use key works, normally you'd be wall humping like in Wolfenstein, not in Project Warlock, because the use function works 360 degrees around you, so you could be facing the other way and the secret wall still opens. 
Project Warlock has 60 levels, by the way. Not that you'll really notice, when I first picked this game up and realized that the levels were mostly bite-sized and that you could do them in under five minutes, that was kind of a relief and a curse, because I started playing it and fell into the trap of, oh, I'll just do one more level, and then five hours later I was at the final boss and oops, game's over. It kind of grabs you, so much so that I went into another playthrough on hard while I was making this video, and I'm just playing it again now. The first levels of the game aren't the best introduction. I guess it's like Wolf 3D, but there's better stuff later later, like the city level, the Egypt section is a bit of a letdown after the comparatively better sections before and after it, and it gives me the serious Sam GBA vibes again, except it runs at a decent frame rate and doesn't make me unstuck in time. Because each episode has unique monsters and new weapons, you'll see a ton of both. By the end of episode 1, I was carrying 9 weapons, not that I used all of them. I'll find a few that I'll use most of the time, like the minigun or the shotguns, which are nice. The regular one sounds great, and the level you get it in makes it so you feel like a god for the rest of it. But then you upgrade it, I can choose between an auto shotgun, yes, or a slug, nah, but I like the option. Of course, there's also a double barrel. How do you upgrade that to be better? You either add two more barrels, or you make it into a flat cannon that does fire damage. By the end, everything gets so fast and frantic, and I think that's probably what sets the combat apart from the other retro throwbacks. Some of the stuff in the game is kind of jank, like elevators, and occasionally the performance dips. It shouldn't, considering all this crispy low-res stuff. This is actually the first game by the 19-year-old programmer. I guess he's like 20 now. But when you think first game, you don't ever think enjoyable and fun game with good ideas and mostly solid mechanics, but here we are. No, shut up, I'm so tired, TNT's boring? Stop asking me to make a boring video, I just finished a whole Thief series! Let's rock and roll! Viscerafest has a demo out. It's from Fireplant Games and Acid Man Games. It runs on Unity. I love the shit out of it. Good boy. Now play dead. Blind? Retro aesthetic? Yes. Build engine like protagonist that talks all the time? You betcha. Caroline is some kind of eldritch monster who looks human and is one of the most insane and bloodthirsty FPS protagonists I've ever heard. <laughs> I regret nothing. You know how Sibby likes him crazy. They're gonna have to glue you back together in hell! <laughs> Even when it's just Caleb lines. I've got two guns. That should be enough for all of you. I've got two guns. That should be enough for all of you. Which are also themselves secondhand. I have two guns. One for each of you. Caroline is a bounty hunter looking to buy an engagement ring for her. I don't know what that is. And this guy here is the perfect target. Oh yeah, we get this much story and narration in the demo. So the plan simple. Break in, kill the target, collect my pay, and get home in three days. Just in time for date night. Now, <laughs> let's get this bloodbath started. It's not that it's about the shooting and the murder and the awesome music, which is by Andrew Hall. Oh my god. It's not Andrew Halshult. It's friend of the show Marky Music. Viscerafest focuses on movement, strafing, bunny hopping, dashing, incredible air control, resource management. You actually don't get a ton of ammo because Caroline can berserk punch things by default. There's not really health pickups either. You jib enemies and eat them. It's absolutely savage and really, really fun. Just in the five levels in this demo, you get a decent amount of weapons. Pistol, SMGs, shotgun, absurdly powerful laser shotgun that you get no ammo for, and grenade launcher that you get almost no ammo for. You all should know going in that it's going to be obscenely difficult. I played through this demo on the medium skill. The recommended skill is the one right above that, and it didn't absolutely massacre me until the fourth level. Uh, 
highly recommend this one. Katie, do the stamp. Thank you. Now do the Beetlejuice gag. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Did you hear Proteus went into early access, Civvy? Did you hear? Did you hear that Proteus came out into early access? Yes, I know. I'm a Kickstarter backer. I've been playing Proteus this whole time, watching it as it grew. And even I wasn't ready for the early access campaign. Can I get a reading? He's gone, Civvy. You drove him away. You want to do it? Civvy, you have to tell people what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Back when I did a short video on the alpha demo, Proteus was a slightly too doomy pixel game that was kinda jank and had some performance issues that it probably shouldn't have. Now, it has a lot less performance problems, only a few times did it hitch for me. Instead of one level, it has a dozen of them, plus time trials that can be accessed in a Mario World style minimap, ten weapons, a fantastic level editor, but is it still too doomy? I mean, yeah, a bit. Most enemies have easily referenced counterparts in Doom. Your Imp, Shotgunner, Chain Gunner, Pinky, Cacodemon, Pain Elemental, Lost Soul. But it does try to mix it up later in the early access campaign with... There are powered up versions of these enemies and a couple that seem wholly original. That being said, if I were to say that it was very doomy, sort of like a mishmash of Doom 3 and Doom 64, it is still really good. The early access campaign is so polished I can see my own minor complaints about it being petty and unimportant in the grand scheme of things. What it takes from Doom is outweighed by the absolute joy of playing it. It is like being drunk on pixel blood. It is fast, brutal, intricately balanced, finely crafted, and thoughtfully designed at every turn. Except for the weapon selection stuff, you have to bind the number keys yourself because there's so many here and it's kind of a mess. Oh. Never mind. But once I got that down, take a look. I don't think I've ever seen so much blood. And looking at how these enemies die, I can tell if there was a not insignificant amount of time dedicated to putting as much blood as humanly possible into it, while keeping it so that you can properly see enemies and visual cues behind that blood. Proteus maintains such a delicate balance with stuff like this, and it's no wonder it's been taking so long to make. They're making it right. The sounds, the music by... Oh, hello again, Andrew Hulshalt. Who would have thought that you would show up here? Proteus levels are pretty much all science bases right now, unfortunately. A lot of them are huge, and I think it's a testament to the level design that I never get lost or even need the impressive 3D map that comes with it. Proteus is just good. It's designed with a deep understanding of what makes this kind of game good. And I can't not talk about the Super Shotgun. the one millionth time Sivvy talks about shotguns in this video. Four barrels. We are done with Double Barrel. Double Barreled is fucking yesterday. Double Barreled is your grandpa's super shotgun. Listen, Nightmare Reaper, Project Warlock, Postal 4, and Proteus all have fucking quad shotguns. 
We have gotten to the point where two barrels isn't enough. Three barrels isn't enough. We need four. And if they're all good, I'm on board. This one in Proteus slays, and it sounds like the buckshot coming out of it is slicing the barrels apart as it's exiting the gun. Jesus. It's a little disappointing that the secondary fire sounds exactly the same as the primary despite being four times as powerful. I was skeptical of Proteus before, it's still too doomy, but when it's this well designed I can't honestly complain. Now that I've got those out of the way, next time we're doing another Christmas grab bag, I can't wait to play Xmas Zombie Rampage 2. Jesus, I wish that was a joke. <laughs>